spots. I don't discriminate and I'm in garages, basements, um, doing the down and dirty projects most of the time, nothing super pretty, but yeah. it's fun. Um, and like I said, serving the Rochester, New York area, but that's me. Wonderful. Well, thanks. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, last. thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Marge, why don't we go to you next? Can you unmute yourself or, oh, not a, there you go. Um, my name is Marge Smith. I am actually the director of Aurora House Comfort Care Home, which is a hospice house in Spencerport, New York. Um, but I also have a sideline business as a wedding officiant. I'm here basically for Aurora House, but you know, I might take a little bit for the other one too. <laughs> you never know. Um, the Aurora House is a two bed house, a nonprofit organization that serves people in the last three months of their lives. Mm -hmm. And I've been a director there since January of 2019. Um, and before that I was a hospice social worker. So I just kind of moved into that position. Uh, and we're always looking for ways to get the word out about our organization, about what we do, and the fact that we don't charge our residents or their families. Um, it's strictly uh, as, as you can help us, we ask for donations kind of thing. So, and no insurance reimbursement, anything like that. So we're always looking for ways to make us um, more well-known in our community and the surrounding area, the Rochester area. That's amazing. My stepmother passed away a couple of years ago and we had, she was in the Albany area and we, it was our first experience with a hospice house and what a gift, truly what a gift for the family and for the patients themselves. So thank you for what you do and uh, I appreciate it. Uh, Melissa, why don't we go to you, Vanderhoof? Hi. Um, thanks. My name is Melissa Vanderhoof. I'm located in Ithaca, New York. I'm actually from Dryden, Dryden area. Um, and I work with Finger Lakes Wealth Management. We're a locally owned and operated family business. 66% um, woman owned, which is uh, rare for finance. Um, we assist people with estate planning, retirement planning, um, budgeting, financial plans, all different kinds of, um, you know, financial health and wellness kind of things. Um, we also specialize in uh, sustainable investments, socially responsible investing, and um, just really like to assist people to align uh, the investments and money with values. So um, yeah, that's about it. Thanks. Sounds great, Melissa. Thank you. Jody, can you pop on? Huh? Yep, hold on a second. I got to find my... They want to surprise okay. you, but I thought... <laughs> I, I hope I don't look as green as I feel. <laughs> oh, you look beautiful. My name is Jody Brown. My business is Holy Education, which is a play on the words that heal, whole, holy, all come from the same root word. Um, next month, I have an online course coming up called Maintaining Emotional Wellness During a Pandemic. And I have actually been um, taking a lot of my own advice the past couple days because um, the events of, of last week, I, I am not physically ill. This is emotional illness mm -hmm. that is making me nauseous. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been trying very hard to um, do some meditation, stay in some kind of routine. Um, these are all things I go over in my course. And one of the ways, one of the main reasons I am here be is because connection is a big part of, of maintaining emotional wellness. And so I'm sorry, I don't feel well and can't yet leave my face out here, but I am glad to be at least connecting with you um, on an audio basis. So thank you very much. You're welcome, get well. Thank you. Yeah, I'll get well after inauguration. Yeah. <laughs> Susan Jefferson. <clears throat> Hi everybody, Susan Jefferson. Uh, my business is Tech Creative Web Design and Consulting. I am in Rochester, New York. I'm seeing a lot of familiar faces here, so it's good to see everyone. Um, I help my clients with website, internet products like hosting, domain names, email addresses, as well as um, something that has been, been uh, 
becoming much more popular web stores. So if you are trying to move your business online or know someone who's trying to move their business online, whether it's products, services, classes, um, send them my way. I'd appreciate it. Um, have a good day. Thanks. Thanks, Susan. That was great. April? I'm keeping you guys on your toes. You never know who I'm going to call. <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is April Cacciatore. I own Zensations Therapeutic Massage in Rome, New York. We have seven licensed massage therapists on staff here. And also, I am a certified body mind life coach. And I also have a monthly subscription box called the Zenspiration Box, a life coach in a box exclusively for women. Lots going on here in Rome, New York. Staying busy. Thanks for uh, everyone. Thank you. Deb Coleman. Hi, everybody. I'm Deb Coleman from Syracuse, New York, and I'm a content strategist and copywriter. I support small business owners to put strategy behind their content and their messaging so they can attract and enroll more of the ideal clients they love to work with. You can find me at debcoleman.com and pretty much anywhere on social media at Deb Coleman or at Deb Coleman Writing. Thanks. Thank you. Jackie? Michael? Oh, oh, there you go. Okay. Yep. Hi, everybody. Uh, first, before I get started, I just want to say I have to leave early for, um, I have to have a checkup uh, with the doctor. I'm fine. But, and also I want to thank those of you who have purchased my book and also have reached out to me. And I too, as, as Jody said, and uh, others have said, the connection is, is wonderful. Um, so anyway, I've been a psychotherapy for more years than you could imagine. And, and because of that, I have a very broad view. I've worked with people from uh, very young kids to the elderly. I've worked with people in low income houses and as well as in the boardrooms and executives and banks and so forth. So I have a very broad perspective, practical perspective. So my books are, the book is Hooray for Parenting, Your Guide to Raising Great Kids. And I've just uh, published the workbook and discussion guide. And uh, these are on Amazon. Um, I think the important thing to say in just a nutshell is we're in a new century with incredible changes virtually and uh, social norms and parent-child relationships. And it really calls for a new kind of thinking and a new perspective and a practical way of approaching um, parenting and teaching <laughs> the whole gamut and psychotherapy. Um, I will say many of you have seen Sadie Ann on these calls and Sadie Ann said to me after the, our call a week or two ago, uh, she said one of the things that people um, who would be interested in this are people who like to think. So it's not a quick fix how to book as much as uh, exploring who you're being and how that impacts your role as a parent. And one other quick thing, my, my website is Gratitude Leads, and I've just gotten up on the uh, homepage uh, a description of how I've gone from gratitude, a really intensive study of that, to hooray for parenting. So thank you. And I will have to leave early. Thanks, okay. Tracy. We'll miss you, but have a good appointment. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Linda Healer. Good afternoon. My name is Linda Healer. I'm a professional certified coach and owner of Live Inspired Life Coaching. And I've changed three times what I was going to say since I <laughs> listening to you ladies. So um, I want to say that um, the Dalai Lama said back in 2009 that it's the Western woman who will change the world. 
And so my job is to help women discover their power, get through the people pleasing, the perfectionism and all of the thoughts and stuff that are going through their head that are keeping them out of leadership or from being powerful leaders and in their life, at home, at work. And so that is my passion and that is my purpose is to help them find their purpose in the world. So um, I also educate the difference between what coaching and counseling is and how coaching picks up where counseling leaves off. Mm -hmm. So if you are interested, you know someone who would like to have a conversation, please send them my way uh, because we got some work to do ladies. Thank you. You're welcome. So good to see you. Okay. I think because somebody left, so everybody shifted. I think, Jill, you have not gone yet. Jill Bates. Hi, everybody. My name is Jill Bates. I'm in Rochester, and I am a real estate agent. Um, and I'm a positive person, uh, for those of you that know me well. <laughs> And so the upside of COVID is real estate. Your house is either too big, too small, or just right. So if you have any real estate questions, give me a call. Um, the, as you know, the market is a lot of buyers, not enough sellers. Um, if you know someone that wants to sell a house, but they don't want to list it, we can talk about that. Um, and um, the rates are the lowest in history. I mean, pretty soon they're going to be giving us money. So anyways, Jill Bates, Rochester, New York. All right. Awesome. And I see that we was Renee near past that, that I didn't ask because she popped off, but she popped, popped back on. So Renee, go ahead. Good afternoon, everybody. Yes. I apologize. My internet seems to be not great. So I don't know if you could actually hear me talking right now, hopefully. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, so I apologize for that. Renee Nearpass, I'm a licensed acupuncturist in Fairport, New York, which is the Rochester area. Um, I own a clinic there called Parrington Family Acupuncture, where I provide healthcare services based in traditional Chinese medicine, and I focus on women's health and pediatric care. And I look forward to the program today. Great. So good to have you here. Thanks for being here. I, I didn't miss anybody, did I? Anybody? No, all right. That was great. Guess what time it is? 12.25. You hit exactly what you were supposed to hit on my timeline. So thank you for being so accurate and um, yeah, just wonderful. So at this point, I just, we're going to be turning it over to Christy, but I just wanted to read uh, just a little of an introduction um, for her. Um, Christy Mitchell has a passion for helping women succeed in their businesses. With over 10 years of marketing experience, an MBA in quality and organizational improvement, and her own entrepreneurial ventures, Christy has a knack of problem solving and leaving everything better than how she found it. What a great introduction. So with that being said, uh, please help me in welcoming Christy Mitchell. Thank you so much. That was such a kind introduction. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my presentation here. So um, depending on your style, feel free to turn your video off. Um, I'm going to kind of minimize everything um, just so I don't get distracted. Um, but you should be able to um, change it to small active speaker video um, if you want. And then that way you should only see me and then the slides. Um, otherwise, the videos may take up too much room. You might not be able to see all the information on my slides. And just for anybody, that view box should be in your upper right hand corner if you need to change your view. Sorry, Chris. Yeah, and you can also, um, depending on how familiar you are with Zoom, you can move that. So I've actually moved the video over oh. to the left. Oh. Um, so whatever makes sense for you, so you can see the screen, um, you can move that around or just minimize it um, if you just want to hear me and not see me speaking. But as Tracy mentioned, um, again, just housekeeping. If you guys want to be typing questions into the chat box, Tracy's going to be monitoring that for me. Um, so I can kind of get through some information. I will pause um, after my really kind of meaty slides of content um, to get a little sip of tea and to answer any questions about that specific topic. But then at the end, we'll also have more time for questions. So if it's something specifically pertaining to that slide, feel free to pop it in the chat box then. Um, and we'll also open it up for maybe some more detailed questions at the end. 
So I'm super excited to be here. I want to echo what Tracy said and thanking all of you for, you know, choosing to spend some time here with us today. Um, I am really excited to go over this topic. I was excited to talk to Tracy about it. She immediately, you know, really wanted to do a present, have me do a presentation on this. Um, so I'm really excited to kind of jump in here. Um, so whether you are a solopreneur, an entrepreneur, a part of a larger organization, um, no matter what your role, my goal in putting this together was really, there's going to be something for everyone. So whether it's you would be the one implementing or you working with a marketing person within your organization, implementing, asking questions, um, hopefully you will get some very tangible takeaways from this presentation um, that are going to help you move forward and use marketing data to work more strategically in the year ahead. That's our goal. So here's the agenda that I plan to go over. So just a little bit about me, probably not much to be said um, after that wonderful introduction by Tracy, um, but I'll touch on a little, a few points about myself. Um, we'll talk about the benefits of a marketing audit, right? Why are we here right now? Why are we talking about this topic? Why is it important? How's it going to help you in your business? And then I'm going to dive into five areas of a marketing audit. Um, these are my own five that I have created that I think are very important. There are we could really break down each one of these topics into its own separate presentation because there's just so much to cover. Um, but I just, tr I tried to pull out kind of the main highlights of each topic, again, to give you tangible things to take away from this presentation. Um, but we'll go through each of those five areas. And then, like I said, we'll have more time for questions at the end as well. So let's jump right in here. A little bit about me. Um, as Tracy said, my background, you know, listed here. Um, Kind of the narrative that isn't included in that is that, you know, I've spent over 10 years um, of my career working in marketing roles, um, but I've recently kind of been drawn back to this passion that I have for like organization systems and process. Um, and so I've been doing my marketing consulting business for almost two years now. And what I've really learned in that time is what gets me really excited. And what gets me really excited, as Tracy mentioned, is working with other women entrepreneurs. I feel very passionately about being able to structure my own work time around my family. Um, as you can see in the picture, I have a beautiful six-year-old son who I am now homeschooling given the current state of the world, which was unexpected. But I'm just so incredibly thankful for being able to run my own business and be able to structure my time around that. And so if there's a woman entrepreneur entrepreneur who's running her own business or thinking about starting her own business and she's struggling with how do I do all of this? How do I come up with a marketing plan? How do I organize the details of my business? Whatever that challenge may be, um, that's exciting for me if I can lend my advice and my help to take some of the overwhelm out um, and to save people time and energy so that they can be more successful in their business. So that's kind of the direction that I'm taking my business going forward, being a bit more intentional about the clients that I'm taking on, because I want to be excited about my work um, as well, which I'm sure all of you experience, um, hearing all your backgrounds and the type of work that you do. A little bit on the personal side, as you can see, this is my family. Um, we love spending time outdoors. We're very outdoorsy people. I actually chose a, a homeschool curriculum that allows us to be outside a lot, which is good. Um, and I'm also really passionate about healthy living. So after having my son, I started taking a really hard look at the products we were using, both personal care products, home cleaning products, realizing the amount of toxins that we are all exposed to in our daily lives and making some more educated decisions about the products that we're using. So I'm very much into essential oils. I sell oils in Norwex, very, very side business. It's really just because I feel so passionately about the difference that those products have made in our lives that I really just want to help share the word of that. So if that's something that you just want to have a chat about, I am more than open to scheduling a time to talk to you about that because um, it's just kind of my little side passion project. So that's a little bit about me. Let's jump into our program. So benefits of a marketing audit. There are a bunch of reasons, I think, to do a marketing audit. So I like to explain to people, I'm very much like right side, left side of the brain. I feel like I'm a good balance. I love the creativity, the brainstorming, all of that, but I'm also very data and numbers driven. And I love using data to help make decisions so that we can work more effectively, make um, better decisions. So the first point here is refining your efforts. So by looking at data in your business, it's gonna help you figure out which areas 
you know, maybe you need to focus more on, maybe you need to focus less on, really like hone in on maybe some key priorities that are going to be most beneficial to you and your business in the year ahead, which all of these points kind of tie together, but the second point here, prioritizing initiatives. So it may be that you already have an idea of what things you want to tackle in your business from a marketing standpoint in the year ahead, but maybe by going through this process that I'm going to talk to you about today, you may uncover an area of your business that you didn't really realize needed some help and needed some attention right away. So it may cause you to change your priorities um, and what you want to tackle first. And the third thing is really improving focus. So again, you know, we're going to talk about five different areas of marketing. It's, it's a lot. Hopefully it's not overwhelming, um, but it's going to really allow you to hopefully pinpoint a couple specific areas that will help you hone in, be very focused on those so that you can make a big difference in your business in the year ahead. So let's jump right in. The first topic I want to tackle, social media, we can't avoid it, right? It is everywhere um, for good, for bad, for ugly, um, for whatever. It can be what you make of it. So everyone is probably on a variety of different social channels. Um, but what I'm going to talk to you today, just kind of in general terms, are some data points that you should be thinking about as you continue or maybe start your social media efforts this year. So the data that I'm going to be talking about, you can pull directly from whatever platforms you're on, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, um, all of those. If you are using a social media scheduling tool, you might be able to pull data right from that. It just depends on what kind of tool you're using. Um, I specifically work in HubSpot a lot, so you'll hear me refer to that software platform. I work on that with some of my clients. It's a platform that really brings everything all together, especially from a data standpoint. So it does make some of this a lot easier, um, but you don't need a fancy tool. You can just go to your social media channels and be pulling this data. One thing I will caution you about if you're not already aware, Instagram is challenging when it comes to data. So Instagram only allows you to look back 30 days. So unfortunately, um, a lot of the things I talk about are like looking at a full year's worth of data or even six months is a great you know, chunk of time to be looking at data. Um, but unfortunately, Instagram's only gonna let you look back 30 days. Um, so if you haven't been doing that, I highly encourage you to start if Instagram is a platform that you're on, start a spreadsheet, put your months across the top row and put your data points on the left and just fill in those numbers. I personally put a reminder on my calendar at the beginning of every month. So I remember to go in and check those numbers and pull them before the data is gone and I can't get it. That's just for Instagram. Um, as far as I know, all their platforms still allow you to pull historical data, um, but just one kind of caveat I wanted to share there. So followers are a really good thing to track, right? That means your audience size. So how many people are following you on your social channels? It's a good thing to keep track of. You obviously always want to continue to grow your followers. But the second point that I'm going to talk about here is your interactions. So that's not just telling you how many people are following you. That's telling you how they're engaging with your content. And that's really important. And each channel kind of measures this a little bit differently. So on Twitter, it can be retweets. It can be likes. It can be comments. Um, on Facebook, it's going to be likes, shares, comments, those sorts of things. So every channel is going to measure it slightly different, but you really want to get a good sense of how your audience is interacting with your content because you could have tens, hundreds of thousands of followers, great, but if they're not interacting with your content, then what's the point? Um, so having a smaller audience who's highly engaged with your content is a lot more valuable to you than a huge audience who isn't really interacting at all. So both of those are very key data points to keep track of. The next thing I want to talk about, which is a little bit more difficult to measure, it's not a specific number necessarily, but thinking about the type of content that you're sharing, whether it's a video, a text, you know, just text-based format, a link that you're sharing, trying to drive people to a blog post that you have on your website, um, whatever that may be, just trying to, you know, look over the past few months or six months or a year or whatever amount of data that you have to look back on and sort things by sort your content your posts by top engagement um, to get a sense of you know oh wow i noticed those videos really engage people a lot more than when i just write content or maybe it's vice versa and i can't tell you that there's a there's a best thing that you should aim for because it varies industry by industry and it varies person to person and business to business so you really have to look at your data to see what's resonating with your audience the next piece is the time and the day of when you're posting. So you, again, this isn't a science that you can just go in and say, oh, yep, okay, here's, here's what I need to do. 
but looking at data over time can help you kind of tease out some takeaways that will help you kind of optimize your efforts. So if you're finding, wow, nobody really engage, engages with my content on the weekends, why do I even bother posting on Saturday and Sunday? I'm only going to post during the week. Um, that may be something you decide to do, or it may be completely the opposite. Wow, my audience engages a lot on the weekend and not during the day, um, during the week. Or it could be nighttime versus daytime, all of those differences. So again, it's not an easy thing to pull out, but if you're looking for kind of trends, that can be helpful because you want, obviously want to be posting at those times when people are more likely to engage with your content. So let me pause there. That was a lot. Sorry, I tend to talk fast. So if I'm talking too fast, let me know. Um, but are there any questions yet about what I've covered? There are none in the chat box yet, but does anybody have a question? And if so, unmute yourself and ask it. And if not, keep your, if it comes to you afterwards, we'll come back at the end of the program with questions as well. So. All right, perfect. So the second part of the marketing audit that I want to talk about is Google Analytics. Um, so this may be scary, depending on your background and your experience with Google Analytics. This might feel a little intimidating, um, but if you don't have access to your own Google Analytics account, you should definitely talk with your um, website admin, whoever manages your website, um, to grant you access. Or again, if, it's, if you have a marketing person in your business, go talk to them about this stuff that I'm going to cover. Um, but Google Analytics can give you tons of great insights. One little side note, Google Analytics isn't just a everyone has it from the get go thing. You, it should be installed on your website when your website is created. So hopefully that has been done already. But again, if you don't know this, good thing to be asking um, the person who manages your website. Again, it can be a little intimidating. There's a lot of data there. Um, one thing you can honestly do is just go to YouTube and type in like, Google Analytics for beginners. Um, how do I find my data in Google Analytics? You can find a lot of great resources on YouTube. Um, and actually as a sidebar, I'm gonna start creating my own video resources because I'm realizing how helpful these could be to people. Um, so stay tuned for that. I gotta get my YouTube channel back up and running. Um, but a few, a few pieces of data. Now, again, Google Analytics is a topic I could talk about for an entire session in itself. I'm only hitting on some key highlights here. Um, to help get you started with you know some really important pieces of data that you should be looking at so the first one is new and returning users so this is telling you how many new people you're attracting to your website and also how many people are you bringing back who were already an existing audience for you um, so those are really key pieces of data i personally in google analytics you can choose whatever date range you want in the top right corner I really like looking at a date range and then comparing it to the year prior, which is literally just a checkbox when you're selecting that data. I find it very helpful if I want to say, okay, how did I do in 2020 compared to 2019? Um, I'll pull the full year's worth of data and check that box and Google Analytics will automatically show me the side by side numbers. So it's a great way to take a look like oh, wow, I'm attracting a lot more new people to my website. I don't have as many returning visitors. Maybe that's an okay thing for you. Um, or maybe you're seeing, wow, I have lots of returning visitors, but I'm not really attracting new ones. I need to be thinking of ways that I can get new people seeing my content. Um, so those are really helpful things to be looking at. The next piece is pages per visit and average time on page. These are two different metrics, um, but they really are telling you the engagement on your site. Like we were talking about engagement with social media content. This is how people are engaging with your site. So pages per visit is an average of how many different pages on your website someone's visiting when they come. Average time on page, pretty self-explanatory. How long are they staying there? So if you're seeing that people are only on your website for 15 seconds, chances are they're not digesting very much of your content. Um, so those, again, are really helpful to just kind of figure out. It's going to start telling you things about your content, about the usability of your site, maybe about the types of people you're attracting. Maybe you're just not getting in front of the right audience and you're getting people there who don't actually want that and they were searching for something else, which we'll talk a little bit about um, in the next slide. Bounce rate is really important as well. So this is going to tell you the number of visitors who are coming to one page and not doing anything else on your website. Google counts that as a bounce. So that means they came in somehow and they left 
they didn't click on anything else, they didn't visit another page um, on your site. A lot of times people ask what's a good bounce rate. Um, it really depends on your type of business and the type of website that you have. Generally speaking, a content-based site, a 40 to 60% bounce rate is considered good. Um, with a retail site, more like a 10 to 40% bounce rate. Um, I feel like this is an area when I work with people, they usually find that they have a bounce rate in the 70 to 80% range, which isn't great. Um, so again, that's when you kind of want to start digging in and figure out why that's happening. Referral sources is the last piece that I have listed here. So those are the different sites that referred traffic to your site, right? How did people get to you? Um, so maybe they typed a search into Google and that's how they found you, great. Um, or maybe they came from social media, maybe they came direct. Um, direct traffic could be someone bookmarked your page so they're coming back um, time and time again. Um, they could be referred from emails that you're sending. If you have a strong email marketing campaign, that could be driving people back to your website. It could also uncover different um, referral sources you have, like other websites. So I've seen this a lot with people who get interviewed a lot on podcasts. Um, usually a podcast website will link back to your website as a speaker on their podcast. Um, so that's a really great tool for you to look at how are people coming? Is it a good mix? Maybe I've only done a couple podcasts, but wow, I'm getting a lot of traffic from those. Maybe that's gonna be part of my strategy in the year ahead to get interviewed on a lot more podcasts to reach wider audiences and drive more website traffic. Just one example of many ways that you can use that information. I'm gonna pause again. Do we have any questions yet? I have one, but I will wait. I don't see any in the chat box. Somebody else have a question before I say something. And mine isn't a question as much as just recently I was checking um, the referrals on my website and saw that it was a link from um, a resource in Binghamton, like in SUNY Binghamton, because we're listed as a networking organization because we used to go to Binghamton. And so it was really just interesting to see that that was still an active link for them because sometimes you don't, you don't know. Sometimes people put you in as a link and then they don't take you off as a link, which, you know, isn't, isn't a bad thing. So I just found it interesting sometimes to look and see who still is referring us from just websites. Yes, that's a great point. Thank you for sharing that. All right, hopefully your heads aren't spinning too much yet from all of this data that I'm talking about with Google Analytics, because now I'm going to jump into the next topic, which is an SEO report. So SEO stands for search engine optimization. Um, again, trying to tailor this to everybody. I'm not sure what everyone's comfort level is with these topics. Um, so please feel free to jump in and ask a question if anything is unclear. With an SEO report, the most robust data that you're really gonna get on this is gonna come from a paid tool, but that's not to say you can't find information for free. So one tool that I really like recommending to people is ubersuggest.com. They, there are some limitations. You can only do so many searches per day and then they cut you off because they want you to pay. Um, but it can still provide you with some really helpful data. So on an Uber Suggest report, they give you an SEO score um, and other tools provide an SEO score as well. Sometimes this can differ from site to site depending on which tool you're using, but basically they're rating your website in a few different categories. So in technical aspect, in the content that you have, in your user experience, and the mobility um, access of your website as well, that will impact this. So really what we're talking about here is how well your website can be found. When someone's going to Google and searching in a term, how's your website performing? And all of these things are gonna play into that. It's not just about the content that you have. There are definitely other aspects that play into that. The second piece is organic keywords. So these are the terms that someone's using. I always say Google, cause that's what I use. I know some people use like Bing, but um, terms that people are typing into a search engine in order to arrive at your website. So this can be a really interesting process for people because you may find that people are finding your website for terms that you never even thought of. Maybe they're good terms, maybe they're not so good terms. Um, there are, you'd be surprised at, you know, different words that can get pulled out that you're using more than you realized um, throughout your website. So it's really good 
to uncover that. And also, if there's certain keywords you want to be found for and you're not being found for them, well, that's going to help inform your content strategy for the year ahead. Maybe you need to be thinking about some new landing pages of content offers you can have or new blog topic ideas um, if you really want to start ranking for words that aren't showing up on this report for you. Another thing is backlinks. So kind of going back to what we were talking about with Google Analytics. So this is in Tracy's specific example, other sites that are linking to you, it's helpful to be aware of that. Um, you might get more information on this on an SEO report than you would um, through Google Analytics, just depending on the volume of traffic that's coming through, but a good thing to be aware of. And then errors. So this could be broken links, could be duplicate content, multiple meta tags, the list goes on. And some of those things get super technical. So again, it might be, you know, if you have a ton of errors, it might be worth it to look into hiring a website expert um, to get some help to address those issues. Because again, if you have a lot of errors on your site, it could be impacting the overall searchability and people being able to find you. Any questions on an SEO report? Again, I'm just like scratching the surface of everything that I could be like really dived into with these. No chat questions yet. You would think women would chat away, but we're, we still don't have a lot in the chat box. But um, okay. this, I just want to say to you, this is really fascinating. And I think we need to be reminded as women entrepreneurs about this, because if we don't live in the tech world, because we're doing so many other things with our business, try, sales, you know, press releases, everything else, you know, it's just really important to be focused in on some of the stuff. So even if they don't have any question, I think it's fascinating. So. Good. I'm glad. And that's the thing too, I will say, you know, when I first started my own business and consulting, I kind of thought, oh my gosh, I need to go, I need, really need to like hone in on my, I need to like brush up on my SEO skills. I need to take some Google analytics courses and I'm glad I didn't go down that path because what I quickly realized is like, I know enough to ask the right questions and I know enough to go get a professional specialist in this area if I need to. Um, so I think that's an important thing to think about too, you know, knowing enough to ask the right questions and identify potential issues that need to be resolved and knowing at what point it makes sense to get someone else to come in and help you tackle it. All right, Chris, Christy, wait a second here because I've got yep. I've got a few things here. Sure. Um, so, um, like Melissa just said, that she she thinks it's great information because she's in the finance field. That she has very specific questions related to compliance and finance that are actually might be more lawyer uh, have to be directed more towards a lawyer. Uh, Marge said this is great info. You're presenting super well, which I agree on, and so does Jody Brown. Um, and then Renee asked, how often do you run an audit? Quarterly? What would you suggest? That is a great point. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, if you haven't done one before, I would say at least every year. Um, but ideally, I mean, like I said, I make it a habit of pulling data on a monthly basis. I'm not necessarily looking for trends on a monthly basis because I almost think that that's too frequent and you're not going to necessarily find a whole lot of differences probably. Um, I pull the data on a monthly basis and I would say I evaluate it at least quarterly or at the half halfway mark through the year, I'd say, especially if you're Say you're instituting like a new content plan, right? Like, okay, new year, I'm going to get my blogging going. I'm going to be really good about blogging twice a month, four times a month, whatever it is. And you have specific keywords that you're targeting your blogs on. Um, I would hate for you to check next month and be like, well, that didn't work. Um, because to be honest, blogging is a long-term strategy. You're not going to see results overnight. And I would hate for you to prematurely say, this isn't working, I'm not gonna do it anymore. So for something like that, I would say you really need to give it at least three, four, five, maybe even six months before you make a hard and fast decision, like, nope, not working, I'm gonna pivot to something else. Right. So it was kind of a wishy-washy answer, but I also know it's not realistic, right? For everyone to be living in their data, you guys have businesses to run, uh, most of you, depending on the type of position you're in, so. Um, I would say do what works for you at least once a year, twice a year is probably even better um, because what a great time to look, you know, in June and say, okay, halfway point through the year, 
where should I pivot, you know, for the rest of the year? I don't want to keep doing the same thing I've been doing if it's not working. Was there another question that came up? No, but Renee said thank you. That answers her okay. question. So no okay, other questions at this time. Okay, awesome. So up until this point, we've really been talking about what I, when I think of like a, a marketing funnel, I don't know how many people are familiar with that term, but like you're filling up the top of the funnel and then you're bringing people down and eventually selling to them. So everything we've been talking about is kind of like that top of the funnel, right? Like bringing people in, getting them to know about your business, interacting with your content. And now at this point, when we talk about email marketing, those are people who you're already connected with in some way because you must have their email address if you're able to send them email marketing content. Um, so we're talking about like mass emails here. We're not talking about one-off emails through Outlook or Google. These are like your email campaigns that you're running. That's what I call them. Um, you are probably using a tool for this. Um, so there are a bunch of different tools that people may be using, MailChimp, Constant Contact. Again, I talk about HubSpot a lot because that's what I use with some of my clients. There's a variety of email marketing tools out there, and that's really where you're going to want to go to pull this data that I'm going to talk about on this slide. So an open rate is the percentage of people who are opening the email compared to the total population that you sent it to. Again, people always ask, well, what's a good open rate? Um, and not to avoid that question because I want to answer it, but I want to first say that it's very specific industry by industry. So I would urge you to go out and do a quick Google search. What's a good email open rate for the finance industry or whatever industry you're in to get more specific? As a general rule, 15 to 25% is a good open rate. Um, some of the clients I've worked with, their standard is like a 30% open rate, like that's what they go for because that's what they've seen. Um, other clients, 15, if they can stay at 15%, that's pretty good. Um, their email list is huge. It may be tired um, from hearing from them a lot. Um, so it really varies industry by industry and just with your specific business. A great thing to do is just kind of look through, depending on what tool you use, you can like easily scroll through and like see some trends in the numbers um, of your email open rates, um, but just kind of some general rules there. A click-through rate is the percentage of people who are clicking once they're in your email. Um, so again, rates can vary industry by industry, but usually about a two to three percent um, click-through rate is considered good. Um, one thing I forgot to mention with an open rate, um, sometimes people get a little confused. They think, oh, my open rates aren't good. I must have to change the content of my email. When you think about it, if your open rate isn't good, it has to do with your subject line. So your subject line is not compelling enough to people to get them to open it. Um, some tools give you the ability to do an A-B test. So that means you could create two different subject lines. Um, and depending on the tool, some of them I've seen, which are great, you can do an A-B test. And what it will do is it will only send your email to a small portion of your list to test out which subject line performs better. And then it will automatically send the rest of your recipients the better performing subject line. Um, so again, that varies tool by tool, but I just want to put it out there, something to think about um, if you're looking on improving that open rate. Um, the click-through rate. So sometimes people don't even think about this in their email content. Like what is the point of the email that you're sending? Is there a very clear call to action? What is it that you want somebody to do? Um, I've seen some data out there that advice um, that says you should only have one call to action in your email. You want people to do one thing. What is that one thing? Is it to click on a register button to register for an event? Is it click the call me now button to, you know, call my line directly and have a conversation about quoting your project, um, whatever it is. So I, I find that people use businesses usually struggle with only sticking to one clear call to action, but something to remember, because I think sometimes people send emails and they have zero calls to action. Um, so you really want to be thinking, what's the goal? Are you driving people to your website? Are you wanting them to call you? Are you wanting them to respond and answer a question? Um, so just thinking about that as you're creating the email content. The bounce rate, um, similar like we talked about on a website, so a bounce rate is the percentage of emails that were undeliverable. Now this can happen for a variety of reasons. I can go into all the nitty gritty. It's a little mind numbing. There's hard bounces, soft bounces. Basically an email could bounce um, if somebody's email inbox is full, if their email server is blacklisting your email server, 
um, which can happen in like a lot like bigger companies. Um, it can happen for a variety of reasons. Maybe there was just an error in the email servers talking to each other. Um, so somebody may bounce once and then the next email you send, they don't bounce. Um, unless it's a hard bounce, that means it's just gonna keep bouncing. Um, but <laughs> like I said, without getting too nitty gritty in the details, you really wanna see less than a 1% bounce rate. Um, but again, a good thing for you to just kind of scan the past emails that you've sent. If you see that you usually only have one or two people, um, or I'm sorry, that was for my next point. But if you see like you usually have a 0 0.05 bounce rate, and then all of a sudden you have like a 3% bounce rate, you wanna look at that and figure out what might have happened with that email. Um, maybe, I mean, it doesn't happen often, but I know Google has had some, you know, Gmail issues. So maybe it was just something beyond your control, um, but just something to pay attention to. With the unsubscribe rate, that's the percentage of people who have opted out from your email. So if you know email best practices, you should have a footer in there that allows people the option to unsubscribe. It's a law, you need to have it. Um, and you wanna be looking for, again, less than a 1% unsubscribe subscribe rate for sure. Usually about a 0.2 to 0.5 is kind of like industry overall standard. Um, but with this, you know, you may have a really great email list and you may only get one or two unsubscribes here or there. It hurts. Trust me. I know. I try not to take it personally. You hate people to unsubscribe and say they don't want to hear from you anymore, but it happens. If you usually only see one or two people and then all of a sudden you get 15 people unsubscribed, from one email, take a hard look at what that email was about. What was the subject line? What was the content? What were you asking? What were you telling? Um, and just think about that as you go to create future content so you can be more strategic um, and avoid it. And a lot of times, I mean, I've worked with clients before, it can be the frequency. I mean, I, I tell people you really shouldn't be emailing more than once a week, depending on your list. Um, it can, you know, if you send too many emails, people may not want to hear from you anymore. So just something to think about. Let me pause there. Any questions about email marketing? None in the chat box yet. But I'm just gonna say right. that I, I agree with you. I hate unsubscribe rates. <laughs> it's something that always bothered me. But you know, a lot of times when they can write a reason, it might be, I'm not a woman entrepreneur anymore. And then you're like, well, that makes perfect that makes perfect sense. So, yeah. you know, sometimes it's you should take a few minutes to to figure out why they might have unsubscribed. Yes. Don't take it too personally. Yeah. Anybody else going to put in a chat box question or raise your hand? Oh, wait. Oh, hold on. Uh, Marge asked, what can be done about server issues? Not a lot, unfortunately. Um, sometimes it can have to do with the platform that you're using. Um, I'm trying to think if there's I feel like there was one in particular that I can't think of now. Um, Act on. Okay. Act on was a tool that um, actually a previous employer of mine used, and we found that our emails got blacklisted a lot by other email servers. And so, really, it ended up being a matter of moving off of that platform and using a different email marketing tool. Um, unfortunately, you can't really do anything if their email. Aside from changing the, the server that you were using to send emails, there's not really too much you can do, unfortunately. Yeah, Marge said that the Rochester uh, Roadrunner account didn't deliver a campaign to about 200 addresses um, mm. they sent out. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I feel like it would probably get into a whole bunch of technical stuff that you'd need someone looking into on the back end um, to see if there's anything that can be fixed. Sorry, I don't have a better answer for that one. All right. Okay. No other questions at this time. Okay. The other thing too, actually, um, that makes me think a lot of times I recommend to clients to do a resend to non openers. Mm -hmm. um, some platforms make this a lot easier. I think const I don't tend to like constant contact, but I think that is one thing that they make very seamless. Mm -hmm. You can just audit as you're setting up your email campaign, automatically say resend to non-openers in three days with this different subject line. Um, so if you do it, I highly recommend using a different subject line because, you know, I mean, someone might have just been too busy and it slipped on their inbox, but it's giving you the chance for kind of that second redo. So I would, I would just quick, you know, leave the rest of your email content the same, but quickly 
you know, try a different variation of a subject line um, and resend to your non-openers. Um, Cause it may, I don't know about the Roadrunner issue. Like it may be, it was just like a glitch that time of day. So maybe you can catch those people a few days later. Mm -hmm. um, but if it's kind of a systemic ongoing issue, that's not gonna work. Yeah, Marge said that she sent them from her regular email address instead and they went through in small groups. Mm -hmm. So it was a matter of that helped. Uh, and then Deb said MailChimp makes it very easy to resend to non-openers. And I do know that okay. Constant Contact does that as well, like you said. Yes. Yeah, I think from my experience, I think the Constant Contact is even more seamless than the MailChimp one. Um, but definitely something that in other tools, I mean, it might not be as straightforward how you can do it, but usually you can like pull a list and say, pull everyone who didn't open this email and then use that list to be your send list and just copy the email again, change the subject line. But something to think about, especially if you put a lot of time into the content that went in that email, you know, you really want to increase the chances that more people are looking at it. All right, ladies, we're in the home stretch here. My fifth area that I saved till the end because I feel like it can be the most elusive, uh, difficult to kind of pull this data, but I think it's worth talking about. So this data is not typically something that you can easily pull from a system. It's gonna depend on how you track your information. Um, if you have a CRM system in place, it's gonna make it a little bit easier for you if you don't. Um, it might just be worth thinking through the exercise and figuring out how long it might take you to start coming up with these numbers because this could really impact your business in a positive way when we talk about those key points of a marketing audit and what they help you to do. So when you think about your business, um, I'd be curious how many of you know how many leads you brought in in 2020. Um, a lead could be, you know, a lot of the people I work with, it's, you know, someone filled out a form on my website and now they are a lead in my system. Um, some people, if they're very events based, it's collecting business cards at an event, maybe. Um, so it might look a little bit different, but if you could answer the question of how many leads did you bring in in a year, I would say that you are far ahead of the curve than most people. Um, cause a lot of these things just years go by and we don't really think about it. Um, but starting with how many leads you brought in, and then where did those leads originate from? Again, I, I use the example of online versus, you know, in person. But even online, there are so many different types of leads that you could be collecting. Did someone come to you from a social media post? Did they come from a specific landing page, a content offer that you put out there? Um, how is it that they came to you? Um, and then thinking about how many of those leads you closed in a year does a certain type of lead have a higher close rate than another type of lead? Again, these are very specific and I know that it could be overwhelming. You're like, I don't even know where I would begin to pull that information from. Um, so if it's a little overwhelming, that's okay. But it's just something for you to be thinking about, especially if you're moving forward with some new initiatives in the upcoming year, you really wanna be able to measure, was that worth it? Was it worth all the time and effort I put into developing this webinar and putting it on and how many leads did I get from that and how many of those leads actually turned into business. Um, you know, sometimes when you go through this process, you might discover, you know, if you're a type of company who's running paid advertisements, maybe you're doing Google ads and social media ads. Well, you might come to find the Google ads far outperform the social media ads. Um, I'm just using it as an example. It could actually be the complete opposite. Again, it just depends on your business and your audience. Um, and the types of ads that you're running. But it's a really helpful way to start thinking like, okay, you know, a lot of people are suffering from decreased marketing budgets right now. That's just a fact. People are, are not able to spend the type of money they used to spend on different advertising initiatives. And so if you have to prioritize, prioritize and say, I have to cut something, well, why not look at the data and see, you know, of those, of those new deals that I closed this past year, where did they come from? Um, and really focus your time and effort on those channels instead. Maybe it's referrals. I hear that from a lot of people. The best performing leads I have are referrals from other customers. Well, think about how often are you asking your existing customers for that referral for new business? Um, it could be really low hanging fruit. Maybe you just need to pick up the phone or do a, you know, a targeted email campaign to your customers and not your prospects um, to have those conversations and ask if they have someone in mind to 
you know, might want to work with me similarly to how you work with me, um, that kind of example. I think we have some questions, so I will pause. I saw something flashing. Yep. Um, Trish asked, how often should we measure our lead conversion rates? That's something I would say definitely every year. I don't know if you necessarily need to do it more than that, maybe six months. Um, and again, it might depend on if you're doing a new, some sort of new advertisement method that you haven't tried before. Um, but I would say now is a really great time to look at the past year. And maybe it's, you know, maybe thinking about all of your leads is like way too overwhelming because you don't have a good system in place think about all of your clients, right? If you could go to a system where you invoiced everybody and pull out all of the clients that you had, put those in a spreadsheet and then figure out how they heard about you. That's a great place to start and then sort that spreadsheet. Oh, half of the people I did business with were referred by past customers or found me on social media or whatever it is. So I would say definitely, definitely at a yearly mark, but maybe six months. Another question from Susan, is there a tool that allows you to connect to all your social media accounts and consolidate all your data? That's why I love HubSpot. Um, that's my go-to. So I actually, when I started my marketing consulting business, I thought that I was specifically just gonna focus on HubSpot because I love the platform so much mm -hmm. and I implemented it back when I worked at RIT. Um, that is a tool that brings everything all together and gives you really great insights into how, how people got to you. I mean, it gets very, very nitty gritty as far as like you could do lead scoring models and figure out the likelihood to close somebody based on how they interacted with your website and your content and all of these. A lot of people find it too much utility. It can be a little overwhelming, um, but that's the first tool that comes to mind for me that kind of brings everything to one place. But with that being said, I will also say I would, you still need to use a tool like Google Analytics because there's just some pieces that don't get captured that you'd want to. I don't think there's one, I haven't yet found one foolproof tool that brings it all together 100% um, cleanly. Awesome, okay. That's it for the Anything else? I'm gonna say that kind of brings me to my question slide. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Maybe too much to type. You want to take yourself off mute and yeah. ask. Yeah, anybody do that because we have a we've been on great timing. So we have um, probably have another like ten minutes that we could take questions or comments or concerns before I do a wrap up. Christine, I have a I have a question. Yep. Um, so I have I, this is specifically about Facebook. So I have a. Uh, a business page and I also have my personal page and what I noticed was I started getting I would get more interaction on my personal page so I started posting more uh, business related things on my personal page and then uh, then sharing them to my business page mm -hmm. so when I come doing this audit <laughs> It's, I, I just, I, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that and uh, if you have any ideas or suggestions. I'm smiling because this is something I've been thinking about with my like newer business venture focusing on women entrepreneurs. I have not created a Facebook page. I don't think I'm going to um, because I feel like it can be very difficult to gain a following on a Facebook page. It's one of those things that depending on what expert you go to and what article you read, everyone's going to have a different take on it. Um, for me, I would say it depends on your audience and where your audience is and how they're interacting with you. If you've tried both and people are following you and not your page, I say go with it. Um, if you're someone who's trying to like create a community, you know, a page or a group might make more sense um, if you're able to do that. Unfortunately, with the social media platforms, it, they change their algorithms and how you get found. And I find that it's becoming increasingly difficult on Facebook and Instagram because of the way that they've 
changed and tweaked their algorithms over time. For me personally, in the year ahead, I will say I'm focusing on LinkedIn for sure. I find it to be the best way to get found by new people um, because of the way that it's built. If someone likes my post, it then gets shown to all of their network. Facebook used to be like that, but it's not anymore. Um, you'd have to like share my post on Facebook for you know your audience to actually see it, to you know get that kind of like spider web effect of you know spanning out and reaching more people. But LinkedIn doesn't make sense for most for most like B two C companies, right? Like if you're working with individuals or you're like in a retail, it just depends. There's not a hard and fast rule of like what the best place to be is. It depends on your business and the audience that you're trying to attract. So I'm sorry, that was a very long-winded answer to your question. <laughs> no, it was, it, was a, a, it was a really great answer. And I, I seriously have been considering uh, just deleting my business page because it just is, it's too much. Yes. It's too much. And I agree. I really like LinkedIn. Yeah. 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 Thank you. You're welcome. The other thing I'll say too, um, kind of those data points that I was talking to since you're bringing this up about posting on your personal page versus a business page on Facebook, you probably, you're not going to get analytics on your own personal. I mean, you could, you could go through post by post, but they don't have like an insight section where you can easily see data. So that would be more difficult. Yeah. But that's the other thing too. I, I think a lot of social media is an area where people get I feel like can get so overwhelmed and frustrated by, and if you find that one thing works for you, just go all in on that one thing. You don't need to be on five different platforms. You know, I, I always tell people just find what works for you. And it, it might not be what everyone else says works for them. The other thing that I would Thank comment you. on is I think Linda, think of your, your brand. Like when Facebook first came out, I was writing for the Syracuse Post Standard on a bi-weekly bi -weekly basis because of my name being so different. A lot of people knew who I was. I was in the paper a lot. And so it made sense when I started, you know, on Facebook that it was under Tracy Higginbotham. Then adding women ties into it, you know, I wanted people to brand the idea of women ties so they would go to the website and buy from my members and women. So I still maintain two Facebook pages because some people know it better connect me to women ties now through Tracy Higginbotham. So I think it depends a little bit on what your brand image is or maybe what the priority is um, for yourself. Yeah. That's a really great point. And that's something I feel like is becoming more and more a hot button topic is personal branding. Mm -hmm. So depending on your type of business to Tracy's point, you know, whether you're branding your business or yourself, chances are you should be doing some of both. Um, but that's definitely something to think about as you're figuring out if a page makes sense versus just posting on your channel. Yeah. Any other things? Thanks. Anybody have any other questions? Got about five more minutes for questions. Deb, are you unmuted for? Yeah, I, I'll just add that um, it, a suggestion that you check on your, the use of Facebook because it is technically against their terms of use to conduct business on your personal profile. And I know people do it all the time and many it's fine, but they, and I, they, it's not clear where they draw the line, but if they feel that you're, primarily doing business on it, they can shut down your account. I do know a lot of people who that's happened to. So I, my workaround is to post to the page, which is true, Christy, it gets almost zero reach, like 2%, I think these days, but then share it to the personal profile, then you're fine mm -hmm. because it originated on the page. Okay. And, um, and then I do other little workarounds like post on my profile hey, if we're connected for business, are you also connected with me there to try to drive traffic to that? But it's it's happened a lot. You know, people say they're in Facebook jail. Um, they do, if they shut your account down, you can't, it's really hard. It's not impossible to get it back. So just a caution because a lot of people do it, but, um, but it does happen that they crack down from time to time. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. I was not sure. aware. Yeah, and a lot aren't because people do it and they do, it, it works for them for a long time. But if Facebook decides to, 
you know, determine that you're doing too much business there, they'll pull the account. Yeah. I think that's another good point, though, that that brings up for me, my background in marketing, I mean, I've done a little bit of almost every aspect of digital marketing, but I'm really rooted in like content strategy. And that is something I push a lot with all of my clients is that you shouldn't just be talking about yourself and the services and the products that you offer. You need to be providing value to people. And that comes in the form of content that comes in helpful blog posts and, you know, downloadable eBooks and white papers and videos and whatever it is. Um, I, there's nothing more cringeworthy to me, which I could see if somebody's Facebook feed looks like that and you're just products, 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 pushing the latest promo and all of these things. Like I could see those people certainly being easily flagged by Facebook, but I think to, I think maybe what Linda was getting at and we're connected on Facebook. So, um, you know, when you're sharing an article, like, oh, I, I love this article. I love this point, you know, that's providing value to your audience. That's building your personal brand. It's, I feel like those sorts of posts definitely wouldn't get you flagged for conducting business on your personal page but that's I appreciate you bringing up that point Deb because I have not encountered that the only thing and I just real quick yeah go ahead Deb I just want to say I agree completely Christy and I should have been more clear that if you're sharing other people's businesses I don't think they, they don't have an issue with it you're exactly right if you're sharing promoting your own stuff that's what they may look at but you're right yeah. if you're sharing other people's things that's a commonplace thing for the profile the only thing I was going to say is, you know, I have a business um, and it's wonder and it's wonderful, but I mean, I also, there's Tracy Higginbottom who's a speaker. So this is when I get a little crazed with the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world where it's like, you know, I would pitch out Tra Tracy Higginbotham different than women ties. I mean, they're two totally separate entities. So I can see it. And then we have a division, a women's athletic network division and a women's equality division. Well, there are members that don't want to hear me talk about politics and there are members not interested in sports. And so I have Facebook pages for each one of them. Um, so I've never gotten in trouble quite yet, but I'm ready to go to jail if I must, if it's pink. <laughs> <laughs> Linda will come get me, won't you, Linda? But yeah, I think it sometimes goes back to brand again, you know, and, and what Christy's saying, you know, what are you looking at focusing on and marketing in this new year? And then, you know, use your, your tools to help you with that. Um, we have one more question and then we will end it with a big, huge round of applause for Christy. Um, but uh, Marge, I think it was Marge who said um, she's her, oh, uh, okay. A business Facebook page is different than creating a page within your personal account. She's heard that they would lose all their history if they converted the Aurora house page to a business page. Hmm. Do you know anything about that, Christy? I don't, but I'm happy to talk to Marge offline about that. Okay. I It's so, honestly, it's hard because all the social platforms change their stuff all the time. Um, so I know that there are some implications for converting things, but I'm happy to talk to Marge offline about that. Okay. Um, and I just wanted to, here's my contact information. Feel free to get in touch with me after this. I do offer free 15 minute phone consultations. If you have some questions and you just want to learn more about what services I offer women, um, business owners, or, you know, anyone really, um, I'm happy to schedule a call, um, and figure out if it makes sense for us to work together. Okay, everybody has to go unmute so we can give Christy a round of applause. I think, can I unmute all? I think I can. Uh-uh, let's see. Unmute, ask all to unmute. Are you all unmuted? You are. Okay, let's give a big round of applause to Christy for what a fantastic presentation. I could listen all day. And you said things that I haven't even thought about in such a long time <laughs> that reminds me Good. of what I need to do to move forward. And this is why investing time like this to listen to a smart woman entrepreneur gives us enough things that we can add to our to-do list today and tomorrow and next month. Um, so Christy, thank you so very much. And again, we can't do everything there is to do within our businesses. So if this is something that's important to you, please, you know, reach out to Christy and inquire about her services uh, a little bit more. 
I will. And there are, I, sorry, I just want to say too, there are some other very talented marketing people on this call. And I am definitely one to, you know, I focus on what I'm really good at. And if I'm not the right fit for you, I'm going to recommend you to somebody else. Right. So I know Deb and Susan also offer some other services yes. here. Yes. True. Yes. Very different. Well, that's the great thing is that everybody kind of has a niche, but general overall knowledge as well. And so that's why I would say, which leads in perfectly to what I was going to say is, you know, look at that sales contact list and you heard these different women talk a little bit about their businesses. You know, we can't do business with everyone, but we can most certainly start a conversation and find out if we can do business with somebody or partner or collaborate. So that's why I put the sales contact list and do it and give it to you so that you can initiate some conversations with women that are on this call. And especially, as you know, the mission for women ties is to get you before you hire a man in your local area. If you can't find a female, there is to hire somebody outside of your region to do business with, but to choose to do business with women. So please use your sales contact lists this week or within the next week, see where it leads. If you're interested in, I think most of you are members. I don't know, there's only a few of you that are not members. Um, Women Ties, I think I redid my PR benefits and we have about 40 that we offer now for women um, being able to utilize my marketing platform and my connections over the past 30 plus years really um, uh, to be able to connect with other women. And the, I think of myself as like a woman entrepreneur matchmaker, I guess that's sometimes the best way to, to describe what I do. I just got an uh, email this morning from a woman who hasn't been a member in, I don't know, maybe five years, maybe seven years, emailed me and said, Tracy, I'm looking for this person. I want it to be a woman in this region. And it's a region that is up in Oswego. So I'm like, thanks for thinking of me. Absolutely. I have some names for you. So that's just another, you know, another way that I continue to try to send business to my members and stay connected with people that aren't members anymore. Um, if you go to our website, something new that I'm doing for members, because I really want women to bring in as much money as they can this year with the pandemic, is I'm actually listing on the Women Ties homepage, website, and events page events that our members are doing so that they can get even more promotion than just sharing it on social media. So there's three different new events on there. Jody mentioned one of them, which is hers, which is uh, February 7th, maintaining emotional balance during the pandemic. Uh, there's one on 216, which is a free book launch with Andy Simon. Her book is Rethink. Andy is a PhD. She's in the Hudson Valley region. She's an amazing woman. And she's interviewed a lot of top female entrepreneurs and women in business. And she was supposed to launch the book during the insurrection on last Wednesday and had to reschedule. Um, and also Laura Thorne from our group has a, I don't have the date written down. Look on the Women Ties website. She's offering a one day, mm, I think it's business planning workshop. Uh, for $99. And she's really excellent. I've taken a couple of her courses before. So when you go to the Women Ties page, you'll see that if you're a member and you have an event that's business focused or female focused, then send it to me and I will get it up and we will share it like it's one of ours. The next Women Ties member only meeting is February 2nd. So members can sign up for that. And this is just an opportunity for members to be able to meet each other a little bit more and promote what's coming up for them. And then we'll have another educational program in February. I just have to get to it. So that's it, I guess, so far. Anybody have any other questions or comments or anything I overlooked? No? One more round of applause for Christy Mitchell then. Very sweet. And applause Thank to you, you for, for taking time out of your schedule to be here today. I so appreciate it. I love spending time with you, especially in my quarantine time here. So um, thank you. And if I can do anything to help you in the near future, please reach out to me. I'm happy to do so. Thanks so much, Tracy. Yep, you're welcome. You have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, thank you. Bye, bye. Nice to meet you all. Bye. 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 bye.